my privilege to welcome to the stage Representative Baxter Chapman, who is also running for Commissioner of Agriculture. Welcome. While he was a state representative, he was the Vice Chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection, Environment and Natural Resources Council, and Chair of the Government Council. He has been the Chief Executive Officer of Labor Solutions, a personnel service, uh, with five locations in Central Florida for the past 20 years. He is married to Becky Troutman, a former teacher with a graduate degree in school psychology, and they are proud parents of their daughter, Holly Kate. So welcome. Thank you. Tell us why you want to be Commissioner of Agriculture. Well, that's a great question, one that I've been asked quite a bit. I, uh, frankly, it started when I was 17. But the, the bottom line, the reality is, I have a servant's one. I, uh, you know, frankly, I don't have to do this. Uh, I'm not doing it for a job. I'm not doing it to uh, as a career advancement. Uh, <laughs> certainly not doing it for the glory or the fame because it's a it's a job. It's a constantly ever changing job. And so, you know, I, I have a servant's heart. I care immensely about the ag community the people who make it up, the lifestyle that goes with that. And I think that it's worth fighting, protecting, and defending uh, because agriculture is a big deal for our state of Florida. It's a huge economic drive. So agriculture representatives has been, uh, been beat up lately in Florida, especially citrus, right, with uh, various diseases and then the hurricane that came through. So what would you do as Commissioner of Agriculture to try to improve the condition of Florida farmers, especially in the citrus industry? Well, as it relates to the citrus industry, indeed, we have seen, because this is, the citrus industry is, is the industry from one side of the right? Uh, but the citrus industry has been changing over the past 30 years, irrespective of the green disease. Uh, we've seen a lot of consolidation, it's just, the, the nature of farming as a whole is changing um, across the entire nation. But um, specifically to citrus greening, we have got to continue the fight to find the cure for the disease. Uh, the industry has been all hands on deck. The industry has, has self-taxed self themselves for, for research. Um, the state has, has held the government has held. Um, it's, it's the iconic industry in agriculture to the state of Florida. Um, so, you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs a year come as a result from the citrus growers, from the, and it starts with the growers. But why that's so important isn't just about the growers. Uh, it's what I refer to as the economic pebble in the pond ripple effect that comes from that. If the, if, the, if the growers, if the citrus growers are healthy and viable, then all the ancillary businesses, insurance, banking, fuel, etc., chemicals, all the, the, all the businesses that um, feed off, if you will, the citrus industry, the growers, they're, they're in peril as well. So it's not just about the growers. One of the things, and, and at least, I, I wish I had a cure for hurricanes, but y'all figure that out. Y'all well, figure that out, we'll all be in great shape. So it's, uh, you know, the plight of the farmer is simply that. They're always, their back's always up against the wall. Um, you have to be, you know, a husband, a father, a, a etymologist, a market maker, a meteorologist, I mean, all these things. And, and weather is one of those events that only one person can control. One of the bright spots to me about Florida agriculture is the diversity now we're seeing of different crops. We know how blueberries now are a big deal in Florida. I, I read about olives being potentially a new crop. Can you talk about how important it is to diversify Florida agriculture and what's on the horizon? Sure, so uh, hands down, uh, we, and that's been one of the points I've talked about as I've traveled the state on the campaign trail is that 
Uh, we, we as, as the industry, and working with our scientific counterparts in most of Gainesville, uh, need to continue to embrace and investigate alternative problems. Um, indeed, blueberries came onto the scene some 25 years ago. That's proven to be generally a good alternative product. Uh, there's been a, a splash with peaches. Uh, IFAS uh, developed a, a particular peach variety that uh, is centric just to form the cause of chill hours that it takes to set from. Um, you know, we're seeing hundreds of thousands of acres of citrus go by the wayside. And absent of a cure for that, the uh, alternative in most parts are rooftops. And I'm not anti-development, I'm not suggesting that for a minute, but um, do you think we have societal issues now or demands on water issues or resources rather, or quality of life, air quality, etc. Wait till there's 30 or 40 million people living in this state. So part of, I think, part of my charge would be to, to continue to investigate alternative crops as you mentioned, we've seen blueberries and, and peaches. Um, I know some citrus growers who are have, have planted hops. Now, you would think hops, that, that's an interesting product to be growing. Well, you know, farmers need to adapt to what the market needs are. And in this particular example, uh, this fellow has <laughs> struck a chord with several of these microbreweries around volcano and he's growing one of the primary ingredients that they need to fulfill that particular niche so i i find it hard to believe that that anything can replace the citrus industry because of the infrastructure the deep infrastructure that's there existing in our processing plants etc but there are alternatives uh, i know another family ironically my sister and brother-in-law uh, have just recently planted 35 acres of bamboo. Uh, is it a risk? Absolutely. But um, I hope they make a billion dollars. <laughs> I really do. Because, you know, it's that kind of creative approach that, that farmers are going to have to embrace until there's a cure for citrus, or for green, uh, to save on. Because the alter we know what the alternative is. You know, farmers are pretty simple people. They want to grow their crops, raise their kids, worship their God, and be rewarded for their their, their work. And I think it's in, very incumbent upon the Ag Commissioner to carry that banner and lead that charge. Since you brought up uh, hops, um, I'll go one step further and ask you about another crop that's being grown in Florida, which is marijuana. We have uh, passed a constitutional amendment in the state that allows for medical marijuana. Uh, most states have. It looks like the marijuana industry in the country is growing. There's some estimates that marijuana will be a half a trillion dollar industry in this country. Uh, we've granted licenses for um, I think a dozen or so folks to uh, grow marijuana in this state. What do you? How do you view that? And what do you think the future of that is as a part of agribusiness? Well, first of all, as everyone in this room probably realizes. It's not regulated by FDAX. It's regulated by the Department of Health. Um, look, if, if I had a very sick child or family member that could use that product as a medication and bring about positive change for that person's life, that loved one's life, uh, I'd probably be in the front of the line. Uh, I don't think, again, even though the the projections on the revenues are so high that, uh, that it's ever going to replace the amount of jobs that the citrus industry has. So again, it's it's a little bit of a niche, albeit presumably a very profitable niche. Um, I support the notion of medical, but I start I start getting in the gray area when it crosses over into recreational. As a as a um, business owner. We're in the people business. We provide employees to, to client companies. Uh, 
you know, it, it starts running a fine line if someone's recreational using the product or medically. So that's that's a, a discussion that will have to be had in the future. Uh, I certainly understand that from the state's perspective, you know, as long as it's medical, there are no taxes that come with that. So how do you weigh that? Uh, uh, I, I just have to wait and see and be ready for those debates in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years. Yes, sir. One thing that we talked about uh, with your predecessor here was the school lunch program and the role that the Commissioner of Agriculture plays in that program. Tell us what your view is on that, whether we're doing the best we can for our kids and how Florida farmers can be more involved with the school lunch program. Well, if I'm not mistaken, the very first farm to school program was launched in North Carolina. And ironically, that happened about the time I was leaving Tallahassee some eight years ago. Uh, I watched and followed that program from afar because to me it was a win-win-win. Everybody in the, in the supply chain and the ultimate consumer, the students, uh, were, were beneficiaries of that program. Hands down, uh, you got to have nutritional meals. Uh, it's the fuel to the minds, of the, especially these young minds. But I have a, as you mentioned, I have an eight-year-old daughter. She's in second grade. And not over the past few months, but over the past year and plus, you know, periodically, maybe once a month, I'll, she'll ask me to come have lunch with her, which I've enjoyed doing, uh, not just because I like to eat, but uh, because uh, I like to see the activity in the cafeteria. And one of my primary observations is, is simply this. We can provide the most healthy, nutritious meal to those students, but if they don't eat it, what have we accomplished? Mm -hmm. So I fully support the program. Uh, I, I think it's a win-win for all parties involved, but I think we need to maybe take a look at how to get the, the kids to do a better job of consuming the meals. That's a great, that's a great point. I have an eight-year-old daughter too, so, so uh, I know I know those those challenges. Let me, let me ask you one more question before I turn to the audience. Uh, let's fast forward to January of next year. You've been sworn in as the commissioner of agriculture. Thank what, you. What did you want? The people of Florida have spoken. Uh, tell us what the first 100 days of your administration looks like. Well, you know, there's a period. And we'll make some assumptions. Let's assume I'm going to win the primary and the general. You just said. Um, there's about a two-month period there between the, the general and the spirit and ceremony. So I would fully intend to use that period as my, you know, pre-onboarding time um, to take a real hard look. I mean, I uh, right now I'm I'm not focusing on the Super Bowl game. I'm focusing on tomorrow, sure. one day at a time. Um, but I do have a lot of great ideas, I think, that we've made some observations. Um, you know, indeed, hands down, the team that you assemble around you um, is critical uh, to the success of the department. Uh, I think Commissioner Putnam has done a really good job. It's I told him not long ago, I don't know what Ron Zook must have felt like coming in Pines Burger. Uh, but, but be that as it may, uh, we're going to. You know, we're going to measure the board two times before we cut it. We're not going to go in and make a lot of wild, crazy changes on, on day one. Um, much will depend, I think, on his success and his campaign and who he takes with him. So we won't know that until sometime certain it's great observation. Questions for Representative Trump? Thank you again. It's the principal of me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Renata Espinosa. I'm a principal in Lake Worth in Palm Beach County, and I have a few questions for you. Um, first of all, it's about the food program of the school. As I asked the other candidate, I'm interested in your point of view about schools only that are serving Title I schools for the free breakfast, the lunch, and the dinner, and the snack for kids who are enrolled in Title I school. What's your view on having that distributed all around the schools in all the counties? I think, you know, I think when it comes to our educational system, we are such a diverse state. I don't have to tell you that. 
Um, you know, I, I was taught and still believe to this day that the state of Florida is basically six regions in search of one identity. And the challenges that those different regions bring with it don't necessarily apply across the board. There's not a silver bullet. So I think that an issue with regard to Title I in that regard would, would depend mostly in more on the local community's decision on how to govern and, and effectuate a program such as that. But I certainly am in favor of, of feeding the students uh, where, the, where the need arises. My second question is dealing with agriculture, um, believing if, you, if there would be grants out there or assistance for schools, especially in public schools, that are dealing, are growing their own food, as in their basils, tomatoes, is there going to be any funding in the education? Uh, we see a little bit of the funding, but not as much as should be in all across the, the public schools. What's your intake or what is what would you do to have some type of grants or universities or government money helping these public schools to deal more with agriculture and bringing it into the schools? So when I was in school many, 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 many years ago, there was uh, programs that catered to this, to this space. Uh, we had a land lab where our teacher, our ag teacher took us and exposed us to a variety of different agricultural practices, be it livestock, or vegetables. Um, I, I had the unique opportunity about a week ago to tour a really special program in Flagler County where they have I, what I think, frankly, is the model for the state for, for Votech type programs. And one of those areas was, was agriculture. It, it, it went well beyond just agriculture into first responders, EMTs, uh, uh, fire, etc. I, I would love to see, and my wife being an educator, we're big proponents of more VOTEC programs. I would love to see it would work in concert with IFAS or any of the other universities or the legislature and the governor for that matter in trying to earmark some money to in, in special situations start or enhance uh, agricultural VOTEC programs in our, in our, in our primary and element of uh, high schools, in our primary and high schools. It starts then. I mean, you know, I, like I said, I have an eight-year-old. It's amazing how her mind is a sponge. And so those formidable years are, are important. Uh, we're losing farmers. <laughs> but in droves um, and if we want to have a future farming community then we need to start growing those students today. Representative, let me add my thanks again for being here sure. with us today. Um, my question, you served in the legislature. Uh, when you look at the scope specifically of the Office of Commissioner of Agriculture, uh, but more generally of the cabinet itself. Do you feel that the scope is where it should be? Is it too broad that the Commissioner of Agriculture is also the, uh, the head of the Department of Consumer Services and the cabinet itself covers all kinds of issues? Uh, do you feel it's too broad vis-a-vis -vis the legislature? Do you feel it's about right or do you feel like it's too narrow and you should have more uh, power and authority? Great question. Um, I, uh, I have joked on the campaign trail over the past few months now that, that this department is the Rodney Dangerfield department of the <laughs> that, that it get, First of all, it gets no respect, number one. Number two, I think over the past, say, 100 years, if nobody else wanted to do it, we'll give it to the Ag Boys. They'll tend to it and they'll make it work. I, I, look, I'm going to serve at the will of the people be it the legislature determining what the capacity and the role is. But if I were keen for a day, I would tell you that there are a few areas that I fundamentally don't necessarily agree should be in the purview of the Ag Commissioner. And one of which is, is fraud. You know, it, it, it occurs to me that that's more uh, in keeping to uh, some law enforcement type agency, and in my case, the Attorney General. But if the will of the people, 
including all of y'all, say, hey, we're going to leave this the way it is, then we'll do it. Uh, but there are some some areas that, uh, for example, not long ago, and not now, but not too long ago, uh, FDAC's regulated barbers and hair salons. I mean, what's that all about? So I, I think that, that there may there needs to perhaps be some discussions to investigate some of those areas. Uh, certainly not opposed to hard work and opposed to doing it if that's the will, but there are some areas that make me scratch my head. Thank you. Uh, can we have a... So uh, the question is, how are you influenced by Ben Hill Griffin, if, if at all? Which Ben Hill Griffin? Well, I think I, my, my understanding is you're related. The third, <laughs> you know, whatever. All right, so it's probably no secret to anyone that, that, that I'm the grandson of Ben Hill Griffin Jr., okay? Uh, I was blessed to be born into a pioneer agricultural family. I'm certainly proud of that. But I will tell you, sir, that that's not what makes my feet hit the floor every morning. Uh, I believe there's three, three types of people on this earth, producers, consumers, and looters. And let me say that again, producers, consumers, and looters. And, you know, just because you're born in a particular family doesn't guarantee any type of success. Now, you may not have to worry about having dinner at night, but, you know, when I was 21, I bought my first citrus fruit with the help of my grandfather, okay? I paid him back every penny plus interest on that first, uh, first purchase. Uh, when I was 30, I stepped out from under the family umbrella, which was a very difficult decision for me and started the business that I still run to this very moment, Labor Solutions, that we've now placed over 50,000 people in jobs in the past 20, nearly 21 years. That's no embellishment. Um, short of marrying the woman I did, it's, that's the best decision I've ever made in my life. So I, uh, I have a very good relationship with my uncle, Ben Hill, and with his son. He, Hill and I were grown, or were raised together Neither of us had brothers, so we were, you know, like brothers to each other. Um, and I, you know, Ben Hill, so I consider him a friend beyond just being blood. So, um, but but at the same time, I don't know if he's here, I hope not, but, uh, you know, Ben Hill doesn't decide for me every day what I do. Uh, but but we have a very special, very close relationship. Yes, sir. We had a question here in the front. Yes. Hi, Representative Troutman, it's a pleasure. Amy Maxwell with Maximus. Just as a follow-on to uh, Robert's question, um, as you were talking about the agency, um, just personally curious as an equestrian and someone who competes here in Florida and Wellington and Ocala, um, I'm just curious as to if you would consider fraud in the equine industry as a area of, uh, that you would want to explore as commissioner? Well, uh, the quick answer is yes. I, I don't know what more I can expound on that, uh, but I'll be candid. I, I'm not aware of what those soft spots are. So to have a discussion and to explore that and become more familiar with it, absolutely. And if it's, yeah, I mean, if it's something that we can help with, then, hey, let's, let's do it. Um, does, that, does that answer your question? One more question. Representative Brzee. Thank you. Representative Trump, how are you? Fine. Um, considering that the department, uh, the office that you're running for also governs energy, what are your thoughts on energy, the energy future of Florida? And what are your thoughts about the engagement of the department or agency with, with regard to energy? Great, great question. So, you know, in my, the last year or so of my tenure with you in the legislature, uh, we, uh, we were beginning to explore solar. Uh, it, it, at the time, wasn't gaining much momentum. Uh, but I will say this, as, as we continue to grow as a state, and we will, like it or not, we 
are going to continue to grow. Sooner or later, everybody either comes to Florida or ends up in Florida. And so we're, we're like I was talking about with alternative agricultural crops, we're going to have to look at ways to generate energy locally, be it solar or crops. Crops could be a fantastic um, hedge between the two, keeping farming going and generating energy. Um, we're going to have to continue to be innovative, I think, as technology comes along, much like we've seen in the solar space in the past roughly 10 years now. Um, as, it, as technology advances become more readily available to us, I think we're going to have to do more with less, and we're going to have to embrace those technological changes and put them to work for us. Yes, sir. First of all, thank you for your ass service. Appreciate you, um, and uh, you're blessed with that lovely wife and spunky child. Very, very uh, 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 bright young, young, young lady. Um, in, in your role as agriculture commissioner, I think you pointed out or referred to it. What would you do to encourage either the regulations or some other method? The fact that we have a shrinking amount of agricultural land. And application of agriculture because one of the things is there's so much value that you get from agriculture and the land the character uh, the sense of something bigger than yourself the, the things that really are kind of part of the Americana okay um, what would you do to kind of encourage that legislatively and for the public support of getting more support behind the importance of agriculture and also not only importance of it Specifically, how can we encourage people to either stay in agriculture or expand? Because the land becomes so much more valuable sometimes for commercial development. As you see, some of these citrus grows, we drive through I 75 years ago, they were all citrus, now they're developments. And I hate to see that, but it just happened. So, how can we encourage more use of agricultural land, plus all the alternatives to agriculture, aquaculture? And, and uh, other organic forms of agriculture. Yeah. Great question. So when I uh, served in the legislature, well, let, me, well let, me, let me back up. In 2001, the Rural Lands Program was codified in the statute. And it was an, it was an infant concept and idea that was not embraced much while I was in the legislature. Florida Forever, was the the program that the state was using be it water management districts or across the board. Um, I'm not saying that Florida Forever is wrong because we funded it fully for many, many, many years, between three to five hundred million dollars a year. But you know, I think like in, in in our personal lives, you know, we learn from our mistakes and we 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 move forward and try not to make those mistakes in the future. Um, I fundamentally believe that while Florida Forever is well intended, the problem with it today is the state then owns that land and we cannot, we've got more land that we can take care of now. We don't need to own more land. Uh, talk with Commissioner Bronson and Putnam about this in, in, you know, at length and we all are locked step on the fact that while it's a, it was a good program, it was the best mousetrap we had at the time. Less than be simple, conservation easements is, in my view of the world, the silver bullet until we find another program, okay, or come up with another program. But uh, in those less than be simple uh, programs, it's basically a private public partnership. It's really what it is, if you think about it. Deep and, and in doing so, it allows the farmers to continue to farm their land in whatever capacity they've done in the past. The farm owner or the ranch manager owner uh, owns that land. So they're managing, they're taking care of, takes all that burden off of the state. Uh, I think, I think uh, programs like that are vital to the long-term, excuse me, to the long-term viability of a of the agriculture community um, and to farming as a whole, um, I, I would fully embrace that. Um, I, have I, Dominique, have I answered your question? I mean, is that 
No, that, that's a good one, but I was trying to get the question is basically so much private land that already private is moving towards development, commercial development, as opposed to agriculture. What can we do to encourage uh, the continued use of agriculture or even some land that's not part of the agriculture to be agriculture? So what are the alternatives? There's so much innate value to, to the whole nature of growing stuff and producing it and selling it. Well, I think, okay. I, I, I feel that we need to do a better job of educating the non-ag community on the value of, of these open spaces or green spaces, the viewscapes, the, the green space, in an aquifer recharge that comes in those naturally occurring lands, the carbon sequestration, the habitat, wildlife habitat. I think it's an educational thing. I think that Two, again, I'm not anti-development, right? I'm really not. But we need to start what I call drawing smart. We need to grow smart. We need to um, think about perhaps more density in smaller areas. We need to do a better job. If you look at the whole state of Florida and you look at developments from 40, 50, 60 years ago and the sprawl that goes with that, I think if we change the way we look at development, and do more with less, that can very well be part of the solution. I'm not saying it's the silver bullet, but do more with less. Because the land, we're, we're not making any more land. There, there's, you know, it's it's a finite resource just like our water resources. So we need to, our, in our planning, our, our urban planning projects, I think we ought to really take a hard look in and how we go about that because we're going to run out of land and you can't pay the whole state so it, it's it's a problem that may well be 50 or 100 years from now but i think that the solution starts today and you might have actually answered already but as far as sustainability of the workforce it seems like even with 21 million people uh, anytime that there's a hurricane or something like that we lose our ag workers and sometimes clay gives are rotten in the fields and whatnot. Is that still the same answer? Do more with less to be able to make sure we've got the workforce we need? And then the longer question, which I won't ask, will have to do with the immigration policy and how, how that. I'll be happy to answer that in the lobby. <laughs> okay. but, but real quick, because I know you're on a tight timeline. But you have just opened up a, a can of worms with me when it comes to labor. This is something I've been doing for 21 years and it is near and dear to me. As it relates to our agricultural labor, especially our migrant workforce, we, we, we the farming community, basically have had to embrace a program called H2A. It's a federal guest worker program. It's broken. It doesn't work. It's, it's a program that, like any other federal program, that's riddled with bureaucracy and regulation that goes along with it. Now, there's been a suggestion in Congress or recommendation to modify it into what's now called H2C. I promise you this, if I do nothing else as your Act Commissioner, I will use this office as a pulpit to the federal government. I know people say that a lot, but with my relationships, having served with other House members, namely Marco Rubio and a week ago, I said Dennis Ross, but that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> but those type relationships, we will use this office to bring about a positive change in these, these programs because, uh, you know, absent of labor, that can be as stifling to the ag community as competition or regulation. So it is critical. And it, that, it's not just agricultural crops. It resonates into you know, lawn care. I mean, you name it. Uh, of services and facilities like this, it, it goes well beyond. But if we can fix it for agriculture, the rest of it will take care of itself. Please give Representative Crowder.